So today I'm going to show you how the walls in the Pyramid of Unas uh, textually, topographically can talk to each other to, uh, to basically complement a message, to complement each other in conveying uh, a special message. And that's why it's just uh, more evidence that the words themselves, what they say, is not sufficient to understand the whole meaning of uh, at least some parts of the pyramid text. I think the position where these words are written is also very important. And uh, I think this is a great example of just this concept. So what I'm gonna do today is uh, focus on this wall here. This is the gable, uh, west gable of the antechamber of the Pyramid of Unas. And as usual, I'm going to take you into the virtual pyramid in a moment to just orient you exactly where we are. And, uh, and then of course, I have to show you the other wall uh, with which this wall seems to be communicating uh, and to create this higher meaning. Um, so I am uh, going to leave this here for a moment, but this is going to be what you're gonna be looking at for most of the presentation. So let me uh, take you over to virtual owners again. So you can see how this is oriented in space. And this is uh, made possible by the Egypt Exploration Society. It's a great website. Uh, and this program here is fantastic because it allows you to basically visit the Pyramid of Unas with, without actually going to Egypt, virtually at least. So this just takes a few moments to load. And as usual, I start at the, at the entry. So as you can see here, the stairs, this is the, the inclined ramp that comes down from the outside. This is, the, uh, this is the north. So we're walking in from the north into, into the interior. Here's the portcullises that used to be here the, the, uh, in uh, the, uh, uh, the sockets where these, these plates used to block the entry. And then this is the entry itself. Here's uh, the last section in limestone. This is where the pyramid texts end. And then we're going into the antechamber. And this is actually a good place to, to show you where we're gonna to go today. So I'm gonna go a little bit further in. So we're looking at the south wall now. This is the, this is the series of texts that I have already discussed in a previous video. So today, we're, I'm gonna to focus on this particular part here. So up here, this is the gable. The, the west gable, because this is west, the west gable of the antechamber or the achet chamber. This, uh, and this is important information, which I'm gonna give you up front is a little bit of uh, uh, architectural design that will come in handy in a moment. So there are 37 text columns here. The, the peak of the gable is therefore not exactly symmetrically aligned with those text columns. So we have 18, uh, we have 18 text columns just to the north of the peak. And then we have uh, one extra 19 text columns to the south of the peak. And so the total comes up to be, uh, comes up to be 37 text columns. And uh, the most important text column is are the, the middle two, 18 and 19. So we're gonna, I'm gonna focus on that section because that is the section of this wall that talks to something that's on the opposite side. And so here is now the east gable of the antechamber or the achet chamber. Here we have 36 text columns uh, and the gable, strangely enough, is also not exactly centered over the middle of those 36 text columns. So normally what you would expect is 18 to the south and 18 to the north of this peak here, but that's not the case. It turns out that it's actually divided into 19 
and 17. And there may be a specific reason for that. And that has to do with this interesting communication, textual communication between these two gables. Another thing I should point out is that the gables, most of the gables are unique texts to the Pyramid of Unas, not entirely, but for example, here, uh, this is pretty much entirely unique to Unas, this entire text here. And on the other side, almost all of this text is unique to Unas, except for the last pyramid text here, 253, which is shared only by one other king's pyramid, and that's Teti. In general, it seems the gables are unique text to Unas. There is a few other places where you have texts that are unique to Unas, uh, for example, here on the north wall, um, the last the last couple of pyramid texts here, and most of what you find here, this is the very end of the pyramid text of Unas. Most of this is also unique to Unas. Uh, so, and that is one reason of several why I'm focused on the pyramid of Unas in terms of this topographic textual analysis that I've been doing is because because if you start changing the text around, if you start splicing in new texts from, uh, 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 in order to create a new pyramid text for another king, then you are changing the topography. And so this may then not be the authentic original design idea by the original author, designer, architect, uh, and scribe who, who laid this whole out, all of this out inside of the Pyramid of Unas. And so that's why I think it's important to um, to look at the original text and the original design, the original topography, and the most original version that we know is the one from the Pyramid of Unas. As I mentioned before, there's some evidence actually that this was considered canonical because when there's some middle kingdom tombs that use the pyramid text uh, and they use the version that was that you find in the Pyramid of Unas and not the version that was used in the pyramids of the later kings and queens. Okay, so um, what uh, what I'm going to do now is to uh, switch over to a more close-up view of this gable. Uh, as you can see, the symbols are facing to the north, so we're going to read this from right to left, from or from north to south, if you will. So I'm going to come out of the virtual pyramid now, and I'm going to take you to back to this image. And what I've done here, as you can see, I basically spliced together the photographs that were published by Alexander Pionkov. Uh, these photographs were taken by Elif Hassan, supervised by uh, Natasha Rambova. She was a Hollywood uh, set designer, uh, a, film, a film actress as well, that had uh, uh, was a uh, sort of an amateur Egyptologist. And she got to meet Alexander Pionkov. Uh, he was the chief of the French mission in Cairo and they uh, struck up a friendship apparently um, and went together and surveyed the Pyramid of Unas. And that's how these amazing photographs, these are actually quality wise, resolution wise, among the best photographs you'll find uh, from, from the pyramid text. And so, but the only, the only one issue is that the photographs are not of the entire part of the wall it's uh, usually segments of the wall and that's and what i've done is basically copied and pasted and spliced these images together and that's why you see these little yellow lines here and then i've highlighted a few things that i'm going to uh, mention during the presentation obviously it's it's going to take up too much time if i translate this entire wall for you i'm just going to give you a few highlights and then uh, focus on the things that uh, i wanted to point out so in terms of the thematic of this wall, of this gable, uh, you have uh, you have seven utterances here, seven pyramid texts, and they deal with uh, leaving the duat because you have to remember the, the duat chamber is right next behind this gable. So the sarcophagus chamber or the duat chamber is where the resurrection occurs, the ba and the ka come back to life. And then they emerge from the netherworld uh, the fifth hour of the, the afterlife, which is where Osiris dwells. And then they join into the next station and that's the Achet, the horizon where 
uh, where you become equipped so that you can make it out of the afterworld even back into the sky where the living are. And that's the ultimate goal of the pyramid text is in order to equip the king with special textual magic, which is uh, another, what we understand not as conjuring uh, entertainment magic, but rather uh, something that's sort of what we would call logos, uh, creation through utterance, creation to uh, intellectual conception. And that's that's as close as it gets to understanding what Heka magic is. And so the purpose is to equip the, 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 uh, the revived spirit now to uh, be able to make it out of the, the netherworld. Anyway, so this, so the first segment here, Pyramid Text 247, uh, is leaving is, is basically a description of leaving the Duat. And then uh, the King Spirit appears as the morning star in Pyramid 248, which begins over here. 249, appearing as Nefertem. And Nefertem is the lotus flower, uh, the, the, the personified lotus flower. So that's 249. And then appearing as Saya Perception. And this is really probably the most important part of this wall. So Saya is the personified concept of perception, sensory perception and intellectual perception. Um, to give you just a brief background, what that means is that it is, it is the idea of the spirit in the afterlife traversing the netherworld on a boat. In front of the boat is uh, the lookout, the watch, basically, that looks for obstacles, for, for uh, dangers that could threaten the boat and the crew and the passenger, which is the sun god and the royal spirit. So perception is at the front of the boat and something that's not mentioned in this part is, uh, is then the, uh, uh, the execution, so to speak, of what perception is telling the rudder, the person at the stern who, who's steering the boat and that's who. Uh, so who is at the stern and Saya perception is at the bow or the prow rather. And, um, and so this is Saya perception. And so this is very important. We're gonna get, this is the key portion of the presentation I'm giving today. So then 251 pyramid text, which starts over here. This is addressing the stars from the Duat uh, and then addressing the stars, uh, addressing the, the gods from the Duat is 252, which begins over here. Now we're on the south side of this uh, gable text. And then finally, 253 here is cleansing in the Marsh of Reeds, uh, which is an astronomical, is a description of an astronomical area south of the ecliptic. So where, where Orion is, where the Milky Way is. So this is all considered the Marsh of Reeds. And then when you cross the ecliptic to go to the Northern star zone, you are in the field of offering. So the Marsh of Reeds is, the easiest way to remember, it's just south of the ecliptic. So there's cleansing here, and then you lift up with Shu, and this last bit of pyramid, uh, this last bit of the wall, pyramid 253 is over here, and this is shared, this is not unique to Unas, this, this pyramid text is shared with Teti. So, um, all right, so let me show you a few uh, details of this now. Uh, and in order to do that, I may have to, I may have to open the frame a little bit. So yeah, the frame is cutting off a bit of the text here. Okay. So as all pyramid texts, almost all utterances, they begin with this little phrase here. Uh, Jet Madu means words to be spoken. Uh, so it says here, I, I ren and neck zak, Heru Seda Uru. So what that means is um, your son, Zak is your son, Irenenek, has he has made for you, Enek means for you. So your son Horus is over here. Your son Horus has made for you. Uh, and then it says here, Seda Uru means uh, shivering or quivering are the great ones. Uh, ma Mainsen, as they see uh, 
shot, which means a knife, I met Ock in your arms. So it's talking basically to Una is coming out of the Duat uh, with this allegorical term, a knife. Um, I don't have time to get into what this what this means probably, um, but it's just to po just to point out that this is probably uh, related to astronomy. Um, so this is basically greeting Unas as he comes out of the Duat. Uh, and it's talking about, uh, there's a few things that I wanna point out. So for example, here it says, uh, it's greeting, it says here, let me see, out of the, it's coming out of the Duat here. And then it says, I, I nej herek means greetings to you. Uh, Sai, experienced one. Re, re, uh, Rema enthu geb, which means that uh, that uh, Unas is now experienced, having been revived, and he is conceived by Geb, the Earth God. So, what this means is that the revival, the resurrection, is an earthly event. It happens in under the inside the Earth, which is where the afterlife is occurring. And so I just wanted to point out this term Rema and to so Rema means uh, means created. So this is the word for uh, for creation. And then it says here born to the Aeneid, um, and then a couple of other text items uh, that are interesting here. For example, it says so Hetep Item means uh, satisfied is Atum, who is above the years. So Renput means means the years and the interesting um, part of this is that in uh, under the sphinx i describe a painting that comes from the middle kingdom where you see the sun god uh, strangely enough staring at the at the viewer sitting on a throne and on that throne are three uh, uh, eternity signs and so this is so as the textual correlate for that painting. So you have the sun god, and then of course you have the Aeneid, which in under the Sphinx, I reconstruct to be nine orbits. Um, so the Aeneid is really in, are in the sky and they are the nine bands that surround the sun god Atum, who sits on a throne and that throne is, um, is uh, marked with uh, three eternity signs. And so here we have a sort of a similar idea with Atum who's above, as if he's sitting on them as above his years. Ren, Ren Putev means his years. Um, and then uh, also satisfied are the gods of the East and West, I abet, I meant. Uh, and, um, and then it just goes on. There's a few things that are not so important. You know, it's basically jubilating that Unas is here, Unas Pai, it is Unas, it is, uh, look, it is Unas, uh, uh, watch or behold, it is Unas, here it is Unas, et cetera, et cetera, Unas exists. So this is basically uh, a jubilating expression that Unas has come back to life from the Duat and now he's about to leave the, the netherworld. Even though we are in the antechamber, uh, but we are on the West Gable. So we're still sort of at the border between uh, afterlife and horizon. And that's why this text still refers to the Duat. Uh, then here now, this is an interesting uh, little comment. It says, uh, sebagi. And so what that means is uh, you who hate sleep or he who hates sleep, the slackened one, and then it says, stand up uh, in the in Nedit. And that is a direct reference to the mummy and Osiris, the lifeless body of Osiris that slackened. So Sebagi means slackened. And but hating sleep means that you are basically always awake. That means you're not. Um, you haven't gone, passed on to the netherworld and basically been lost in the afterlife and be dead forever. So you, you, you hate sleep, you hate being dead, basically, and you want to come back to life. And so that, that is a really poetic way to say that uh, the, uh, 
uh, that you hate being dead and you want to come back to life. And interestingly now it says, you the slack one, aha, in the netted. So stand up in netted. And what is netted? Well, netted is the place where Osiris was basically slaughtered by Seth. Uh, it's supposedly in Abydos in Southern Egypt. And this could of course be astronomical, right? So when you look at this could be uh, a heliacal rising of Orion. Uh, in the south, uh, in the southeastern sky, and so, or it could even be a culmination of Orion uh, on the meridian. Uh, it's hard to say, but the netted is basically that part of the sky, probably that's that's looking due south, and this is uh, because that's where Abydos, of course, is from the perspective of northern Egypt. Um, and then uh, the next. The next uh, part that here's, so here's a mention of, by the way, of Seth, Sutesh, um, and Seth has an interesting function here. So it says the Neb, Nebrer means the storm god. Uh, I, I saw uh, Senef, I saw Senef. So, uh, and then it says, uh, I, I said Sutesh. So I said is the spittle. Um, and then I saw in I saw sen means uh, the vicinity in the vicinity of the spittle of of uh, Seth. So this could be a metaphor for moisture, for storm, for rain. It's not clear, but what it comes after then is um, that Seth is instrumental in raising, lifting both the sun and uh, the uh, and Una. So it says. Uh, Uth, F. So he lifts. Du means you. He lifts you. Uh, and then here it says um, So he he lifts you and he lifts Atum. So it's interesting that the storm. So this implies that the the storm winds is somehow instrumental in raising up uh, Unas' spirit out of the netherworld into the Achet horizon, which implies that the horizon is higher up than the afterlife. Uh, or at least that's one way to interpret it. Um, okay, then we continue with 248. So here we have, um, uh, and it, so here now is, an, is a reference to Lions. So we have here uh, Unas. It's a, I should start down here. Um, so it basically says as Unas comes from the thighs of the Aeneid. That's what this means. And then here it says Ayur. I couldn't see the symbol. So this means Ayur means conceived. So Unas is conceived by Ein means by Sechmet, which is the which is a lioness uh, and goddess that uh, becomes prominent in the fifth dynasty. So this would be the, the, the era of Unas. And, uh, and, and then it says, and by Shezemet, which is the, the Malachite. So Malachite is a green uh, copper containing uh, mineral that uh, can be found, was found in, in, the, in Sinai Peninsula and in the Eastern Desert where the Egyptians were mining for copper. Uh, and so this is an interesting asso association between Sechmet, the lioness, and Malachite, green. Um, and then it continues on that uh, Unas is born, Meset Unas, uh, Seba, Subdue. So here now we have basically an, uh, a description of the star Sirius. So Seba Sobdu, Sobdu is Sirius. Uh, and then here I frame this because this is an, difficult to translate um, because it says I, it says Au uh, Shemut, uh, and Shemut means goings. This is how Alan translates it. Au means extended. Go, so extended goings or long goings. But again, I find this interesting that we are in a line column here. If we have a lioness, Sechmet, and of course, 
before Sehmet, there was Mehit, who shall not be mentioned in the pyramid text, so to speak, uh, not directly anyways, because her cult is gone by this time. And so we have, we, we're saying that Unas is born or is conceived by Sehmet. Um, so this is a birth scene. And of course, we have a great sphinx that's reaching out her arms into the eastern horizon. And it is the door to the east, to due east, where the sun rises uh, on the spring equinox. Um, and so, so you could think of this as in you could think of this as a birthing uh, event, and there is the Sphinx indirectly mentioned here through through the uh, through the concept of the lioness, and then we have this confirmation, and this is what I call double stitching, right? So when you have an insinuation of something then what you're looking for is a confirmation that this was intended. And the confirmation may be, although I'm not, I'm not trying to say that this is strongly stitched, but this again refers to an elongated, uh, potentially body of the Great Sphinx, which is unnaturally elongated. And that could be uh, an, uh, a, you know, an, an, a metaphorical a, a insinuation of that. I'm just bringing it up. I'm not, I'm not too sure in this particular case if that's what's uh, what was meant to be uh, indirectly uh, brought up here. Uh, okay, so um, and anyway, so this pyramid text then continues that Unas is M M means Ha uh, Unas M Seba means Unas appears as a star or as the star. And in this particular case, this is the morning star. Okay, now we get to uh, Pyramid Text 249. So here now from the, the overall impression that you get when you read this Pyramid Text is that you go back to a more primordial time of uh, creation because now we're talking about the, uh, the Ayau, uh, which are basically, and I don't know if you can see this, but there's two battle axes or two hammers that are opposing each other. So this is, these are basically feuding, two feuding entities. And in Egyptian mythology, uh, there, are, there are two famous dueling parties. Uh, one is Horus and Set, um, but the other one are the Sheptiu. So the Sheptiu are mentioned in the Edfu texts and they seem to be standing for the, 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 the battle between land and, uh, and water. So this is metaphorical for a great flood that is battling with the great land. And of course, ultimately land wins and land comes back from the flood. And so, uh, and that's how creation occurs. You have the Mount of Creation, the first piece of land. And then on that is where the sun God uh, generates uh, himself. Um, and so this is how you can, this is sort of the context be behind this, the Au, the, uh, the Au are the original one. So this could be an insinuation of the Sheptiu. And then, uh, and then it speaks of, uh, it speaks of the uh, the water lily here, the zesh zeshani, uh, and this is in the context of this primordial titanic fight between uh, between land and water. And out of the water then comes the the lily. And of course, in the lily, I just mentioned in the you know that atum arises on the mound, and that's the heliopolitan version of creation. And then we have the the Hermopolitan, the, Herm, the Hermopolis, so the, the city of Thoth, uh, that's an even older cosmogony. And in that, in that uh, creation story, you have a lily that comes out of the water and opens up and releases the sun. So this is rather, uh, it's beautiful language, it's, uh, but it goes back to very archaic uh, creation story, to the very archaic creation story. Um, and then uh, I wanted to um, also mention this particular uh, item here. So it says Unas Pi with respect to R. Uh, 
Aisheru, which is the linens. So there is a mention of linens, and I haven't been able to explain exactly what this means. It's uh, it says uh, it says the uh, Aisheru Zaa means guarded by the Ayarut, which are the urea snakes, the cobra snakes. Uh, Gere means off the off the night. They are off the night. Gere pu, uh, and then it continues up here. Uh, uh, Agebi, which is the great flood. Uh, Agebi Ur means the great flood. So again, this, this, this whole context here has to do with something that happened at the very beginning of time. So you have the, the feuding parties, most likely the Sheptiu, water and land. You have the flower, the original flower arising out of these waters, okay? And then you have this concept of linen, and this is, I have at linen guarded by the urea snakes off the night. And I, am, I haven't been able to explain this, but it clearly has something to do with, uh, with the great flood and the beginning of time. So, and this is the context that you need to know to understand now why there is a mention of nefertem. So nefertem is, uh, is basically, the personified lotus flower. So here's Nefertem, Zesheni, uh, Er, uh, Sheret, Ra. So it's, it's the lotus flower near the nose of the sun god, Ra. Uh, and if you remember now, I said that this is not a not a strong double stitch here with the elongated uh, goings, which may be a reference to the statue. But now here, we may have another, we might have another possible stitch that goes back to the lioness here. And that is this idea of the lotus flower that's emerging from under the nose of the sun god. And of course the Sphinx is an image uh, in any case after the old kingdom or of the of the sun god Atum, so it's, it's a living image of Atum, and that's what, of course, the the dream stellar states in front of the Sphinx that is stated to the new kingdom. So, to the ancient Egyptians, at some point, the Sphinx became a, an image of the sun god himself, and if that's the case, then the nose of the Sphinx could be the nose of the sun god under under whose under which the lotus flower emerges, and that, of course, is the revived spirit of the king, Unas. Um, and it says here, Peref M. Achet, so he, he has emerged from the Achet, from the horizon. Every, Araneb means every day. Or he, he, not, he, not, he, he emerges, not he has emerged, he emerges. Peref means he emerges from the Achet, from the horizon. Araneb means every day. Okay. Um, and now we come to the all important. So this is the, 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 the prelude, so to speak, to the most important part of this gable, in my opinion, which is Pyramid Text 250. So here now we have, uh, so we, have a, we have basically now the lotus flower, which sets the stage for the next text. And this has to do with perception. So here it says, uh, Jetmedu, words to be spoken, Unas, is the one who is above the cars. The cars are the life forces. So Unas is basically ahead of all the, the life forces of all the beings that um, are basically wandering through the afterlife. And the Medj, uh, I, I, uh, Aibu means he's basically joining the minds, I, it's hard, but it really is the seat of thinking uh, in ancient Egyptian uh, belief. So this is this is not uh, not just for emotions and feelings, but it's also for thoughts. So he has joined the hearts to the one. Harry means the one who's above. Sa means the experienced ones, uh, and and uh, it's, it says sa, and then it says ur means the great. So the great experienced one, sheri, uh, neter meja. So it's the basically the one who's under the godly role, the god scroll. 
Um, and so this is this is a an, an, an entity that's now given a name, and that person that entity that spirit is Saya. Saya, I meant to the west of Ra. So what that means is that uh, this is the, the the boat metaphor that I was giving you. So you have the boat in the afterlife. You have the sun god traversing the afterlife in the cabin on that boat, and at the at the prow of the boat, you have perception, and perception is Saya. And so we learn what we learn about Saya is that he is at the west, meaning to the um, to, to the west is the right. If you looking, uh, if you look at it from starboard, that would be the right of the cabin. So the front, the prow would be to the west, and of course the direction of the boat is across the ecliptic from east to west. So. So it makes sense that Saya would be sitting to the west of the sun. But the most important part of it is that he is in possession, means here, means under, he, that means he's under it, that means he's carrying the scroll of the god. So the godly scroll is carried by Saya, which is perception. Um, and Unas is involved with Saya by joining the minds. So to me, what that means is that Saya is really in the possession of the ultimate knowledge, which is written in this God scroll, and Unas is connecting. Uh, he's at the he's at the, the four of the cars, and he's connecting the life force now with um, with the minds, uh, and he's filling the minds, so to speak, with knowledge from the godly scroll. So what we're looking at here, this godly scroll. That is probably from what I would call the Hall of Records. So the Hall of Records, of course, is a term by Edgar Cayce. But in Under the Sphinx, I describe evidence for a real archive that uh, is a cavern. And that cavern probably is under the statue, what we now think is the Great Sphinx, what we'll call the Great Sphinx. And in that archive is a portable chest, a portable ark, so to speak. There was some information that was somehow instrumental in jumpstarting the civilization of ancient Egypt. And inside of that, inside of that uh, ark was this godly scroll. Okay. And the interesting thing is this term is actually used not just in this mythological uh, context of the pyramid text, but this is actually mentioned. In a on a uh, on a tomb inscription for one of uh, Sneferu's uh, sons and officials, uh, Netaryapev, and that tomb stealer you can still see in the Cairo Museum. And this, the fact that he was the holder of the scroll, is um, is mentioned on that stela. Uh, and I refer to that in Under the Sphinx. Uh, this is something. The stela is something that. Uh, um, I learned about from Peter de Manuelian, he's the harbor chief. He alerted me that there is, uh, that there is, that stela exists. And when I looked at that stela, I found this reference to the God Scroll. I also found a reference to this portable archive, which is called Afdet. So that stela is, uh, was instrumental for um, me to make a connection between a mythical archive containing mythical knowledge written on this mythical scroll with an actual physical correlate. And it just goes to show that this artificial separation between myth and reality that we have uh, in modern times may really just be uh, something that we impose on ancient texts when, you know, when we analyze them, because it may not, I mean, there may not be such a separation when, uh, when a mythical text, a religious text talks about something, it may in fact reflect a physical uh, something. And of course, the astronomy is just another evidence of that, that you know, a lot of the pyramid texts, for example, on the south wall have to do with real uh, entities in the sky. So this is a great example for me to demonstrate yet again that this div division between myth and reality, uh, when you look at ancient Egyptian and uh, ancient ships text is, uh, is an artificial barrier, an art artificial separation that we have created. And there may not be such a thing actually. Um, it doesn't remove the burden of proof. 
um, that you, you have to show that there is such a bridge. And of course, that's why I did that. Um, but once you see the bridge, then you realize uh, there's really no such a separation. So anyways, uh, to make a long story short, uh, in this 18th column here, so we are just about at the peak of the gable, halfway, uh, 18th column, we have this mention of uh, the perception, the, the skull of God, which has special knowledge on it, carried by Saya to the west of Ra. And Unas is involved in connecting to this special knowledge by, uh, by connecting uh, to, by joining the, the minds uh, to, by tapping into this knowledge with the minds. And my assumption is that these minds are associated with the cause because he is above the cause. And to underscore the importance of this very text here, it's practically repeated in the next column, which is column 19. Um, and we don't have to go through this again, but uh, it just basically, it just underscores how important this, this particular text passage is. So whoever designed this really wanted to make sure that this is not only the central, physically, topographically, the central theme, but it's, uh, um, but it's textually also, the central theme of this entire gable. Um, there's uh, some, some other things that I'm gonna go through a little bit quicker now so I can show you now how this communicates with the opposite gable. But uh, the rest of this gable now talks about a festival of the INS, which is the red linens. So there is again a mention of the red linens, which I'm not sure what that refers to at this point anyways. Then, here we have a mention of the, the Unut, which are the stars, and that may be the deacons actually. So this is a timekeeping device that the ancient Egyptians developed and the deacons may have been stars that crisscross the ecliptic and they use those stars to time the movement of the sky. And that may be a reference here, the Unut. Um, and then we have here in 251, uh, we have another interesting reference to the uh, the Pecheret net uh, uh, the Ohau, which are the fight the 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 fighters the the feuding parties again this is similar to what we had over here the Ahu, which are the the uh, uh, the opposing fighting parties so here we have uh, Unas now being inside of a an enclosure or a circle that belongs to these fighting parties. And that's an interesting reference to a place that also I'm still researching it to figure out where is this a place in the sky, for example, uh, or does this refer back to original creation? Uh, but this is something interesting just to point out on the way to the other part of this uh, gable. And so then here we now we have another word that's interesting is called Jeba uh, and Hen, uh, so this is in the context of um, Unas being, it's, Alan translates, translates this as arrayed with the horn, henu, uh, sh sharp horn. So it's a henu sub dead, uh, or, or ten, I should say, this sharp horn, uh, uh, no, I'm sorry, it is, it is uh, sub henu, yeah, henut sub that means sharp horn. Net uh, nechet means strength. Uh, and then here's again a mention of this the knife. So we have uh, the uh, ice, the sherry I set means the one who's holding a knife. So this is basically a sharp horn and a knife. Um, so in this context, you have this mention of Jeba. And initially, when you look close up, it's not clear if this is an upfront leopard or lioness you're looking at. Here's the tail and here's the forepaws. Uh, but there is a sign actually that is um, a, a papyrus stalks that are tied together. And that sign is again seen over here. But it's interesting that the rendition of this particular sign looks indeed more like an upfront line is because of the head. So um, it's not so clear in this resolution, but I just noticed that, uh, that 
that there may be a different way that the sign was drawn and looks almost like an upfront uh, feline. Um, not a strong piece of evidence. I just, you know, what I do is I just fish for things and some of them I discard eventually, but this is just to point things out that I notice on the way. Uh, it just goes to show also that looking at the original text is uh, very informative. If you just read the translations without looking at the hieroglyphic text, you're probably missing a lot of stuff. And that, and part of that, of course, is the topography. So the topography of the text is very important as I'm repeatedly finding out. Um, okay, so just to finish this off now, um, here seda, it's an important term because seda is also mentioned uh, on the opposite of where we are here. So this is the uh, this is the western gable of the antechamber. If you look exactly on the opposite side, which is the eastern gable of the sarcophagus chamber, there is a mention of seda uh, that may be in the context of the 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 original bird cry of creation, the Bennu bird. And that's where you see this word mentioned again. And so that's why I framed it just to remind myself that Seda is also mentioned on the other side. Um, in, in this particular case, uh, it is not referring to the bird apparently, um, but it is more, uh, it is more uh, in terms of uh, shivering, quivering, in being in fear. Uh, but it could be a Heka insinuation of the Bennu bird. So this is something I'm still researching. I'm not sure if we have that here, but um, I just basically made a note to myself here. And here's the second mention of Jeba. Uh, and then finally, uh, I wanted to point out this particular entity here is the Shenu uh, of the bark of Ra. So here's the, the rower. And it says, uh, Hemes Unas, Heno Shenu means that Hunas is sitting or sits with the rower of uh, of the of the bark of Ra. So if you remember Saya is at the prow and the beginning, then you have the rowers, which are basically covering most of the starboard and larboard of the boat. And then at the stern you have the rudder who. And so so this is telling us that Unas is sitting basically where the rowers are. And that's where the cabin is, of course, where Ra is shielded from, his, from the enemies in the afterlife, from the dangers of the afterlife. Um, finally, Pyramid Text 253. So here we have uh, a mention of the Marsh of Reeds. So it's called, uh, it's called M. Sechet, Aya. Sechet means field. Ayaru means reeds. And uh, this is where Unas is getting washed, Ra is getting washed. And this is just what this is saying here. And then at the end, it says, um, over here, it says, uh, su, uh, su Seshu, Su Seshu. So here's an insinuation of Shu air in, in the, um, with the context of lifting, raising. Okay, so we had two, two. Uh, if you remember, we had two general themes here of lifting and raising. One had to do with the storm, God's uh, Seth over here. And the particular word used was, uh, was this one, u there's Seth means uh, Sutesh or Seth is the one who lifts up uh, and he was lifting up the sun god At Atum and uh, and Unas. And here now we have Ra and Unas being lifted up by Shu. So it's a different process of lifting up. And of course, we are in two different parts of this gable. We're on the north side here. We're coming out of the Duat. And then here on the south side, now we're heading for, uh, we're heading closer to um, the, uh, the southern wall, which I covered in another presentation. And there, of course, we have the rising of the spirit of Unas alongside the, the, um, the Milky Way. And there, um, there is a possibility that there's a ladder, if you remember, 
coming down the post of the ladder with the footsteps and Unas maybe climbing up them on this ladder. But here now we have this mention of rising up with Shu. Uh, and so this is an interesting, uh, an interesting second mechanism of coming up into the sky. So here we have basically rising on the air with Shu and here we have rising with the storm winds offset. And now uh, I'm going to uh, go to the, the final segment. And now, of course, what we want to look at is how this middle section talks to the other, the other side of the chamber, which is the east gable. So, uh, so we have this interesting introduction of Saya, which is perception. And we have that coming out of a context, which is right mentioned next to it, that has to do with the lotus flower and nefertum. And it has to do with the nose of Ra. So there is some, the, the context that's being developed here is that we have basically uh, taking in the scent of the lotus and then we have this resulting special knowledge that is written in the, into the God scroll and that is guarded by Saya at the prow of the bark of the sun god. So now let's see what's on the other side of the room in the central portion of the gable. And in order to do that, I have to take you now to a photo that I took uh, just recently. Uh, this is a nice high, high resolution photo. And what I've done here is basically uh, transliterated the entire wall. So it turns out that this entire text, what you're looking at is unique to UNAS. So this is now the east gable of the antechamber. Uh, and so we have a nice correspondence here. We have texts that are almost unique to Unas on the west gable that we just looked at. And then we have a gable on the other side of the wall that is uh, completely also unique to Unas. And so this is a confirmation that you can match these texts. You can look for correspondences between the two texts uh, without crossing you know, a time span without crossing a different author potentially uh, or, or going to a different author. Um, and so that's why I think it's justified that you might be able to find uh, a textual bridge that's topographically matched. So let's look at that. And immediately what you notice here is that column 19 out of 36 is at the gable and then 20 is on the other side of the gable. So this is lopsided. And you might ask, well, this could just be an accident. Uh, maybe it's an innocent mistake, something like that. But what you read in this, in this column here, which is obviously, if, even if this is an accident, this column, the, the gable should really be uh, centering over this division here between, column, uh, between columns 18 and 19, right? Because we have 36 text columns. So it should be between 18 and 19, but rather it's between 19 and 20. So what that does, it basically puts 19 on, in, on, the, on, the, on the south side of this gable peak. And what we read here now in this column, is something that has to do with uh, uh, with uh, with a with a turning two skies. So it says Ayu Deben and F Petai. So for turning around for him for Unas, the two skies. Okay, the two skies are the sky and the under sky. And this is like a vision. So he basically what what Unas is experiencing are the, the skies rotating. Now you have to consider the context from which this comes. The context is that here, this is the cannibal, this is basically the cannibal hymn. The cannibal hymn has to do with in a sort of a gory, gross way. If you think, if you take it literally, it, it's a gory description of eating uh, the parents, eating people, eating the gods to basically engulf devour the magical knowledge that uh, all of these entities have. And it's describing how they're being captured with lassos, they're being put in a cooking pot and, uh, and there is 
the mention of wine, for example. So this is maybe the liquid in which this is all being cooked. Um, here's the wine god. So for example, Zeshemu, here's, uh, they're being slaughtered for Unas and cooked. Fesesen, fesesen, being cooked as a meal for him. And so it's talking about him having breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, it's almost comical when you read this, but when you realize what this is really, what this is talking about in essence is, is the devouring of knowledge because that is what uh, the purpose really is. Uh, it has to do with Hekau. So it has to do with Heka knowledge. Um, so here, for example, you can see Heka, Heka Sen means their magic. Uh, Ayom means to engulf. So he's basically, uh, Unas is the one who is, who's eating unem, their magic, okay? So it's about learning. It's not really eating. It actually has to do with learning the magic. Um, but the key now is that this brew doesn't just, doesn't really contain the people, but the brew actually sounds like a witch brew that's made from wine, lotus, and grain. And those entities are insinuated here. So here's, for example, it's talking about seizing the forelocks uh, of the victims, but the forelocks are written as uh, sheni, shenu, but that is a heka insinuation of sesheni, which is the lotus flower. So here we have the first ingredient. Here's kehau, which is the bowl, okay? Uh, then we have here, as I mentioned, the wine god seshem, uh, shese, shezemu, okay? Uh, and then we have a mention of grain uh, and also a Heka insinuation of grain, which is um, here, there it is. Okay, yeah, sorry about that. So here's the, here's Sheret grain. So Sheretenev, um, so he's basically, it says he's steering his pot, this cauldron with, uh, with their legs. Uh, and by using this particular term for steering, Sheret steer, he's invocating the, the word for grain, sheret. So, so what we have here is basically a brew that's made from wine, lotus flowers, and grain. And he's consuming this brew, and then he starts seeing the skies turn. So, and if you have any doubts, if that is what's being mentioned, then you just keep on going reading. And then what it actually says is talk about emesis. Um, and um, and basically regurgitating certain parts of this brew. So here, their uh, shed uh, ayu, it says here, uh, here it says sebeshu, uh, it's talking about vomiting. So he's basically getting nausea and then he's vomiting up certain parts that he has been consuming. So this entire, this entire text here is basically uh, an elaborate circumscription of what sounds like laced wine that is being consumed, then you have an experience, a certain insight into the sky and you see the sky turning and then you get nauseated and you start vomiting up certain pieces that uh, you didn't consume. Um, uh, and so if you, if you think about it, that, that is potentially what you have here is a special insight that was gained from a psychedelic experience from some kind of laced wine. Um, and this psychedelic experience gives you special knowledge and that knowledge, that special knowledge is of course what we have mentioned on the exact opposite, which is on the other gable, where we're talking about perception, we talk about the, the God scroll and we talk about Saya at the prowl so, um, so I think this is a very nice correspondence between, uh, between uh, two different parts of the pyramid text, one on the west end, one on the east end over here. And they're topographically placed in such a way that you can, that you are, uh, that you are basically uh, triggered, so to speak, to make a connection um, between these two texts. And, and you find this interesting correspondence between perception on the one hand, and then here you have altered perception and enhanced perception potentially that have to do somehow with the motions of the sky. So um, this uh, concludes the presentation. Um, I'm, 
I know this was a little bit of a longer video, um, but text analysis is not easy. And uh, you have to go through it very slowly, um, you know, to find the evidence. Um, but uh, I hope uh, I'm inspiring some of you to, uh, to do your own studies. Uh, as you can see, hieroglyphic is very rewarding. It takes a little bit of time to learn it uh, in the beginning. Um, it's not easy to make it through the first stage, but once, once you pass the beginner stage and you become sort of intermediate and you start reading the pyramid text, then all of a sudden um, you, uh, you have, you're gonna have a lot of fun with it. So anyways, that's it for today. Uh, see you next time.